Hello, everybody. Welcome to Movie Libertas on Logan for Liberty. This is the podcast where I talk about movies and filmmaking in general, the stuff that I like to watch. Um, it is Tuesday. I was supposed to make one on Monday. By the way, if you hear any noise outside, you're going to have to forgive me because across from my where I live, they're doing construction and they're building a wall, a wall, uh, to... They're, they're building a wall to surround their uh, their work facility because where I live, there's a lot of cats and a lot of cats like to sneak over. And I guess they got tired of running them over and having, you know, pet owners bitch and whatnot. Anyway, yeah, so I don't know if you could hear that high-pitched squeal of a machine. Industrial-sized machine moving around, but that's what that was. Anyway, uh, so this is the movie Libertas podcast on... Logan for Liberty. Um, it is Tuesday that I am uploading this. I was supposed to upload on Monday, but I had some work and studying that I had to finish yesterday. So I decided, all right, well, you know, I'll just, I'll do it on Tuesday. And I'm not going to miss a week, but it might not be every Monday. It will, will, will be every Monday, but if I don't upload it on Monday, I'm uploading it on Tuesday. Anyway, today I wanted to bring you a topic about what I feel makes a good movie and I figured this would make sense for me to explain in a video considering I am making a podcast where I talk about movies or at least what I expect from movies is what I want to talk about I am a movie aficionado and I don't mean it in the sense that I'm a movie aficionado because I've been watching movies all my life do you you, have you ever seen those kickstarter campaigns with those trailers uh you know where these people they they're fundraising to make a video game and in the trailer or the video, the campaign video, the person who set up the campaign, they say something like, I've been playing video games all my life. But in the video, they don't mention where they have any sort of formal experience or education when it comes to making a video game, nor do they mention anything that they've learned autodidactically. Any classes, any, any way they self-taught through experimentation, none of that, but they're asking you for money. Like, okay... I am a a driver. I drive cars. I'm not a car aficionado. I I can't tell you the ins and outs of every single detail of every single car of how it runs. You know, uh, I I also play video games, but I can't tell you anything about the video game design process. I've been playing them all my life, so that's not what I mean by movie aficionado. Since I was little, I have always wanted to make movies. So. Since I was probably in fifth grade, as soon as I had access to a camera, I made skits, short films, parodies, vlogs, anything you can think of. And I've constantly studied filmmaking, and I've watched a lot of movies, and I've studied how movies were made, and I paid attention to every single detail in movies, the shots, cinematography. So this is something I've been studying forever. I have yet to put it to practice on a commercial scale. I've t- I've taken video production classes uh, both at the uh, uh, high school level and some f- collegiate levels for fun. Just for fun. No- nothing major. I don't have a degree in you know videography or filmmaking or anything like that. This is just something I enjoy so I learn autodidactically and formally any chance I can get. So I mentioned in the previous podcast that I don't like rating movies. And the reason I don't like to rate movies is because I feel like movie ratings are arbitrary. And I don't deny that there are objective standards by which to judge a movie and determine if the screenplay makes sense, if the director, editor, and actors are competent. However, everyone's interpretation of how objective standards are applied is entirely subjective. Plus... If I rated a movie, I feel limited as I have this feeling I'll lose credibility if I don't pretentiously rate movies lower than what I think they actually deserve. What if I rate too many movies with a high score? Will I seem like I don't know what I'm talking about? Does it make it look like I like everything and have no discriminating tastes? Even though I feel that way, I kind of contradict myself by coming up with a a few standards by which I can personally rate a film. So I can at least have a consistent benchmark where I can juxtapose films I like and didn't like in this podcast. 
and this is my personal channel so this will allow you to figure out you know what what my personal tastes are and from there you can determine whether or not you trust and value my opinion opinions on movies so let's go over what I have selected as the five basic standards by which I judge a movie and then after that I will explain why I don't use certain standards to judge a movie all right, let me take a drink of my uh, Red Bull. All right, um, so number one, did I personally enjoy the film? To me, that's a simple one, because sometimes there's movies that I feel like I've wasted my time on. There's two movies that I've that comes to mind instantly that I can say, ah, you know, <laughs> I kind of wish I didn't watch that because of a, because it was a waste of time. One of them was Doom Annihilation. I feel like I wasted time watching that movie. Um, there's another one. I'm not going to say the title just yet. I'll save it until I upload a podcast about it. Maybe I'll do one a podcast about that pretty soon. I will tell you that it has John Goodman in it. That's all I'll tell you. I That movie that he was in that I'm talking about was terrible. I mean, it, it was an interesting concept, but it just didn't deliver for me, and I didn't really enjoy the movie. I wanted to enjoy the movie. The trailer it made it look suspenseful, but I don't know. It, it felt cheap, I guess. Not like B-movie cheap, but I felt cheated. Alright, number two. Were the flaws distracting? So... When you watch a movie, I, I alright, first of all, I hate people who nitpick movies. Um, there's a few people in my life who nitpick movies, so I refuse to watch movies with them. Or I refuse to show anything to them. But I've noticed they never nitpick movies that they like, that they want to watch, that they are interested in. And, sorry, that's my cat. He's old, he's going to see now. He's about to die soon. I've had him since I was a, a wee Todd. A wee kid. Um. <laughs> anyway, uh, nitpickers. That's, that's what I was talking about. Number two, my standard was were the flaws distracting. And I'm not talking about nitpicks. And I was explaining the story about how there are certain people in my life that when they show me stuff that they like, they never nitpick or they get offensive if I take an issue with a certain detail in the movie. But then anything that you show them that they're not interested in or that they might not like, they nitpick. So it's selective nitpick. Nit, I can't talk nitpicking, and it is extremely annoying. And sometimes half their nitpicks are either untenable or they're petty. And it, I don't know. It's just it's. I'm dubious of of their intentions or why they do it. I I don't believe. I I think they're just being dicks. <laughs> um. Anyway, so, what I'm talking about are actual flaws. So, continuity errors, uh, actual plot holes, not stuff that might not have been explained that can easily be answered via um, inferring, or the details weren't outrightly explained, but they are there. I'm not talking about, like, Star Wars uh, unexplained stuff where they have to release an entire novel or comic book to explain or um, the official guide of... You know, one of their movies in order to explain things that ha that that weren't exactly explained, which is what we've seen with the sequel trilogy. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about. I mean, no, that is what I'm talking about. But f for as a flaw, you know. So I'm not talking about things again that were explained, just not overtly explained. Or things that only take a little bit of inference to explain it. So I'm not talking about that when I say flaws. Again, continuity errors, plot holes, inconsistencies, uh, the flow of the movie bouncing around and not balancing it or um, integrating it in a smooth way. So any momentum that started or any potential that I l had in order that I had to like a movie, any of that potential falters in a way. And I, I am no longer enthralled by the movie 
because of flaws that I am seeing. Or, you know, you might see a boom mic in the background, anything like that. If I didn't notice anything, that's typically a good sign. Even if there's stuff that is there, but the story is so enthralling to me. It looks beautiful. The ethos around the, the movie is not too pretentious, but it's just right. And there, it's like a bastion of beauty and art. That's what I'm looking for. Um, it doesn't have to be, per be perfect at all. A movie does not have to be perfect. There's plenty of movies I can think of that have flaws or that haven't... Older movies that haven't aged well and therefore have flaws. But I don't pay attention to them because of how good the movie is. Number three, would I rewatch the movie? That's a big one because when I watch a movie, I want to be entertained. Um, and even if the movie is bleak, I can still rewatch it because there's a few movies that I really love that are bleak. One of them is 28 Days Later. I mean, it's not entirely bleak because there's there's little, um, uh, what do you call them? The Danny Boyle and Alex Garland, the writer and director, well, the director and the writer in that order, kind of augmented the, the bleak story with a little bit of hope. They rejuvenate it in a way with hope. But it is a bleaker movie, a more bleak movie. I'm okay with a bleak movie. Halloween, 1978 by John Carpenter, one of my favorite movies, is bleak. So, I'm not... That's not what I... You know, bleak movies have rewatchable value. An entertaining movie that just distracts you from the rest of the world. That's a movie I want to watch. Can I rewatch the movie and enjoy it? So, that that's a huge... That's a huge plus. When I go into a movie theater and I come out and I say, oh, I kind of want to watch that again, or I can't wait until it comes on DVD, one or the other. Do I want to go buy another ticket? Or like, I want to buy another ticket, or do I want to wait for it to come out on DVD? That is what I rewatch the movie because I plan on rewatching the movie. That's a good movie. Number four, would I recommend the movie? So if I, if I went and saw Joker and I came out, and, you know, I'm like, yo, dad, hey, hey, friend, hey, hey, cousin, hey, comic book nerd, you should go see this movie because it's pretty awesome. Or this is one of the greatest movies of all time, you have to see it, or you don't know what you're missing. Or, you know, if you just want to eat some popcorn and enjoy a good movie, go see this flick. If I would say that to other people, then it marks off number four in my book. I, would I recommend the movie? And I know it seems like some of these are kind of obvious crossovers like if I would rewatch the movie obviously I think it's good enough for somebody else to see it but that's not necessarily the case because I wouldn't tell anybody to just go watch Halloween 1978 because it's slower burn so they probably it's not for everybody but I would still recommend the movie you know I mean so just because I would rewatch a movie doesn't mean I'd recommend it to somebody else so I just want to make that clear or just because I would recommend a movie to somebody doesn't mean I would rewatch the film. It's do I want to share this movie with other people because I think it is a pinnacle of filmmaking? Then then yes, you know, would I recommend the movie? Of course. Number 5, would I add this movie to my collection? So this kind of ties back into number 3, would I rewatch the movie, but it's different. It, it, there's a distinction in the sense that just because I would rewatch a movie doesn't mean I'd buy it. So, for example, if there's a movie that I enjoyed in the theaters or at a friend's house who's showing me a movie, there's a difference between, oh, if it's on Netflix or if it's playing on TV or if my friend's inviting me over to watch it or, you know, it's on one of the streaming services that I subscribe to, I would, I would rewatch it. But it doesn't mean that I want the physical copy as in the DVD, the Blu-ray, or the case. There's very few movies that I want the case to, but I do like adding movies to my collection. I do like having physical copies of movies that have some sort of rewatchability. Now, it seems like if one of these are checked off, then everything else in my list of five can be checked off, and again, that is not always the case. I can enjoy a film 
but not want to buy it, not necessarily care enough to recommend it to other people, because, you know, I think that this movie is missing from their life. It doesn't mean that I, you know, want to rewatch it, just because I enjoyed the film. Um, one example, I can't think, I'm gonna have to think of some examples. I had some at the top of my head, I should have written them down. Hmm. Anyway, and that doesn't mean there weren't flaws that kind of took me out of it. I could enjoy a movie and have flaws that take me out of the movie. So let me talk about things that I'm typically not going to judge a movie on. One of them is acting. The reason being is because... So, who's a good actor in some cases is subjective. There are certain people that don't like certain actors because... They don't emote enough. They don't show enough expressions on their face that represent the situation. And to me, that's a pet peeve. Kind of. Like, there's some instances where I understand it, but for the most part, that general criticism is a pet peeve of mine. There's Kristen Stewart is one actress who doesn't emote a lot, but I think she's a good actress. I think think she's a fun... I'm just going to say actor, female actor. She is a good female actor, but she doesn't emote a lot. Have you not met anybody in real life that doesn't emote when they're faced with certain situations that should force them to express some sort of emotion like sadness or happiness or excitement, but their face is either bland or they don't react the way you think they are, they're more calm about the situation, they're not as dramatic, melodramatic, they take things a lot more chill. Have you never met anybody like that? Or have you met people that are so bizarre that they react to situations in a really weird way? So that's one reason why I hate the the whole, oh, well, they're such a bland actor and they, they need to emote. Ugh, no, I don't, I hate that because the amount of different reactions or expressions that people have that are so different from other people in real life. And I understand that, you know, this is fiction, right? Movies are fiction, therefore they should react in a certain way. Just like you try to find the most beautiful actors that you can to act in your movie because you want them to look perfect, because you want the visual representation to look perfect, therefore you want emotions to be expressed in a way that is obvious. But there are certain exceptions when people are likable. For example, Mark Wahlberg. Look at every Mark Wahlberg movie. He is the same character in every movie almost. Even if if he's not supposed to be a badass. Or if he is supposed to be the brooding hero or whatever. When he's sad. When he's depressed. When he's angry. When he's a heroic badass. Or when he's affectionate. His character is the same. Because Mark Wahlberg is is such an interesting person that you have him in your movie because you want Mark Wahlberg to be in your movie. Does that make sense? Christopher Walken has that same type of essence to him that he gives off. He has that same vibe. You can't mistake it. You see Christopher Walken in a movie, you see Christopher Walken in the movie. Now we can compare that to an actor like uh, Gary Oldman. He can, you don't cast Gary Oldman just to be Gary Oldman. He can play so many different characters because he, in my opinion, is a character actor. So, for example, um, he played, uh, I can't think of his name now, Commissioner Gordon in the Dark Knight trilogy. Christopher Nolan's the Dark Knight trilogy. He played uh, Commissioner Gordon very well. He also played Winston Churchill very well in The Darkest Hour. So that's an example that... Oh, or uh, Hannibal. I can't remember the character's name, but the guy who was mutilated by Hannibal. He played him very well. You you almost couldn't tell that that was Gary Oldman in all three. And obviously there was a lot of makeup to make him look like a different person. But the mannerisms, the voice, you would have no idea. That's at least in my opinion. Um, examples of actors who, in my opinion, who don't emote enough and are unlikable are people like Brie Larson, and to some extent, Jennifer Lawrence. Those are actors that I can't stand, 
who I feel like should emote more. Maybe, and maybe it's because I personally don't like them, and I'm willing to admit that. Um, another actor who I think you put in movies to get them as a character is George Hart Hartnett. Because in Halloween H2O, in Black Hawk Down, in The Faculty, and in 30 Days of Night, he's kind of, he's the jock. But he sells it really well, he's likable, and even when he's an annoying brat in H2O, you still like him. So, uh, you know, that that's what I'm trying to get across, is that there's different actors who do their talent really well in different ways, and it depends on the director, how they're utilized, and whether or not they're likable. And whether or not they're likable to you, that oftentimes has a huge impact on how you view their acting abilities, and whether or not you will lob the criticism like a bomb, the fact that they don't emote enough. Because that is, con that is not a consistent sort of standard that I see applied to every single actor or female actor known as actress, which is a made-up word. Anyway, well, I mean, all words are made up. Whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, it's not consistently lobbed at actors, especially those who are more likable. And there's nothing wrong with that. Not in my opinion. I would say Kevin Hart, I, I, he hasn't been in a lot of movies. I don't like him. I like his stand-up. It's pretty funny. I don't like him personally. Like, I don't know him. But I don't like... I, I just don't like him. But he's a decent actor, and you cast Kevin Hart in the movie to be Kevin Hart. Same with Bill Burr. He was in Daddy's Home 1, Daddy's Home 2. And you cast Bill Burr to be in your movie to be Bill fucking Burr. And he's an amazing actor when he is an actor. So I hope that makes sense. Bruce Willis is another great example. You cast Bruce Willis to be the brooding badass. You cast fucking The Rock to be the brooding badass. Whether he's a villain or whether he's a hero. Even when The Rock is in a bad movie, he's a great actor. And you cast The Rock again to be The Rock. So I'm hoping that I'm making my, my point very clear. That's why I hate the criticism. I will beat that horse to death. It can be a useful criticism, but what it mostly comes down to, in my opinion, is whether or not the writing is done well. In a movie that isn't written well, where you can't connect with the characters, that's what makes a performance, in my opinion, seem blatantly bland. So if you have an actor that doesn't emote very well, which might just be, again, their personality, which is, in real life accurate so whatever but if the script is so incompetent that you don't connect with them and they seem like a cookie cutter cardboard cutout or they don't react the way you want to then that's in my opinion when I think that the uh, criticism is genuine that they don't emote enough but that's typically rooted in what I believe is bad storytelling bad writing um oh another actor who I think is just fantastic because he he has a personality kind of like Mark Wahlberg where there's a consistent personality that he has that he brings to his roles but in these I think three movies that I'm thinking of that uh, he's in that uh, he just nails perfectly and can change his personality to or his mannerisms to fit these characters, is Cillian Murphy. He was great in 28 Days Later as a sort of, uh, you know, guy who's not really sure of himself and he wakes up in the midst of a, an apocalypse with infected people. He's unsure of himself. He's looking for a father figure. He's insecure. Um, and then Red Eye when he's a manipulative, calm, bad guy. And then, of course, Scarecrow in Batman Begins, where he's this confident, intelligent, creepy, smart guy. Cillian Murphy is a fantastic actor. I almost love anything that he wa that that he watches. I love almost anything that I watch him in. He's a great actor. He knows what he's doing. What is something else that I feel like makes a great movie? Obviously, storytelling is one of those fantastic elements. Ooh, okay, um, 
one thing I want to talk about is suspension of disbelief. Some movies do not work without a suspension of disbelief. And I feel like we give certain movies a pass. This is going to be a video that I'm going to make. I think this might be my next podcast. Because I want to talk about The Happening by M. Night Shyamalan. I just recently watched... What did I watch from him? Oh yeah, I watched Glass. I really enjoyed the movie Glass. And I'll talk about that movie on a podcast as well. I enjoyed the movie Glass by M. Night Shyamalan. I loved Split. I loved Unbreakable. That trilogy is perfect because they're so different. Um, it, it doesn't... It subverts your expectations in a fantastic way, in a perfect way. Not the Ryan Johnson, Last Jedi subvert your expectations. But it subverts your expectations in a way that I wasn't let down. I will admit, when I saw Glass in theaters, I was disappointed with how it ended. But when I thought about it, I was okay with it because... Well, I should have known that M. Night Shyamalan was going to, you know, fuck with my expectations. <clears throat> People wrongly accuse him of, ha of having twists in his, in his movies. Oftentimes, he's not... Sorry about that high-pitched noise. I know that can get annoying. They need to oil their machine or something. Anyway, uh... Or tighten up the bolts. Anyway... What was I saying? Oh, yeah. Um... M. Night Shyamalan isn't a twist, a movie twist guy. He has some twists, which are very good. But for the most part, they're just red herrings. Because, for example, in The Sixth Sense, he gives you everything you need to know to understand that twist. And that's a twist. I know that's a definition of a twist. But then you have movies like Signs. That's not a twist. Glass. That's not a twist. There's a lot of movies where there's not really a twist. The, the hints are there, and maybe you don't know or you're misdirected, but everything is there for you to understand, and that's something I can go into depth later. What was my original point? Um, oh yeah, I think I was talking about how we don't consistently apply suspension of disbelief to movies. So his movie, The Happening, I love that movie. Now, I know it's bad in the sense that the script is awkward, some of the dialogue is weird, but that's always been an M. Night Shyamalan thing. He's always had some weird dialogue, which I personally would describe as surreal dialogue, or dialogue that specifically only serves the plot and is written kind of awkward, but I also see M. Night Shyamalan as an awkward guy, so these movies, in my opinion, are expressions of the ethos of M. Night Shyamalan, as I will call him. But he always makes interesting films. So The Happening. Other than some of the acting, what Mark Wahlberg was forced, I thought the storytelling was good. The, the pacing of the movie was good. But one of the biggest criticisms is, oh, that's a stupid idea, what, plants are killing people? Well, I mean, is that really that stupid? What are you a fan of? If you think that that's a stupid idea, what are you a fan of? Are you a fan of Halloween? Okay, that's kind of stupid. A supernatural killer? Are you a fan of Freddy Krueger? Well, that's kind of stupid. Some serial killer that lives in everybody's nightmares. Jason Voorhees, a giant zombie walking around. Are you a fan of Night of the Living Dead? Well, show me a zombie. Or are you a fan of Star Wars? Oh, yeah, because the Force is real. You know, space wizards and shit. Lightsabers. You know, that, that's all shooting electricity from your hands. That's all fine and dandy, but when it comes to plants releasing toxins, which has some sort of scientific basis, uh, now that's just absurd. What a stupid idea. The thing that this creature can instantly, not instantly, but very quickly manipulate or uh, uh, manifest itself or uh, devour people or their DNA and mimic it. That, th that it can do that that quickly. That's not absurd. Invasion of the body snatchers where this alien's able to take over the host body or I guess mimic their body in a way. That's not absurd. If you like superhero movies, oh, it's not absurd that some uh, LARPer is hopping around on rooftops and saving the world, saving the day. All oh, this person is... You, you, get what I, you get what I'm saying? 
for some reason, we like to suspend our disbelief when it comes to certain things, but never to other things. In real life, the Dark Knight could never happen. Sure, you have people who are amazing at parkour, but right now the technology really isn't there for a bat suit like Batman that protects you from all this stuff. You're probably not going to be that good at martial artists. Somebody will shoot you in the face if your chin is showing. Bad guys don't have bad aim in real life, usually, or always. And even if you did have bad aim, you're going to be able to shoot somebody at point-blank range. Um, eventually you're going to break something, especially if you're doing parkour and fighting. You know what I mean? There's just so many things that you have to disbelieve, that you have to disbelieve, or that you have to get rid of that suspension of disbelief. You have to ignore everything to like this movie, but the simple explanation that plants are releasing toxins, that's just one step too far. We like Insidious. That movie is a very popular horror movie. We don't have any suspension of disbelief over ghosts. Oh, wait, we do. Because not most of us haven't experienced anything like Insidious. But yet we believe it. We accept it. Why? Because we're inconsistent. So that's one thing I want to talk about is when it comes to stuff like that, I'm not looking at, oh, that's implausible necessarily. I, could, I suspend my disbelief a lot, especially with the stuff I like. I love 28 Days Later. A virus in that movie that acts as quickly as it does, yeah, not going to happen. But I suspend my disbelief for that story because that's the universe that that movie exists in. Uh, the TV show Supernatural, I fucking love that show. It's not likely. The Walking Dead, again, not very likely. Uh, Blade, I love that series. Not very likely. I love the Avengers series, not very likely. The Dark Knight Trilogy, I love that, not very likely. The Thing, again, not very likely. So, let's be consistent when we apply, standard, apply standards. And uh, that is episode 5 of the Movie Libertas podcast. Thank you all for paying attention. When you are watching a movie, what are you expecting from it? What dictates what a good movie is, in your opinion? Let me know in the comment section below. Let me know on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. Link is in the description below. Have a good day, everybody, and enjoy some good fucking movies.